Uh, as you know, we've been going through John again, and I think we've had about four sessions in John chapter 6. This is the last session in John chapter 6, and perhaps the most important, because if you look at the way John is set up, chapter 6, he set it up in a very deliberate way. It's building up to this. Now remember, the disciples, they tried to record things faithfully, and they actually had some editorial kind of rights, though. They got to put certain things in and take certain things out. John himself says, if I tried to write everything about Jesus, I'd just fill up all the books in the world. So through the power of the Holy Spirit, he has picked certain things and he has picked the sequence. And there is a very strong literary structure to John. We've talked about that before. It's sort of a bit like a vortex or even a DNA spiral. By that I mean John kind of keeps coming back to the same kinds of things, the same kinds of themes, but in very different ways. And one of the things that he'll keep coming back to over and over again is this idea of belief, this idea of faith and dependence and trust. And as we get to the end of John 6, we find something really disturbing. From that time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. That's John 6, 66. Appropriate numbering, maybe. From that time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Literally in Greek, that means many of his disciples went back to what lay behind. They were no longer walking with him. So this wasn't just a trip or a stumble or a fall. I've got some doubts about you. This was, that's it. I've had it. I'm out of here. And you've got to ask yourself, well, how did that happen? Because he just fed them miraculously, probably 20,000 people. We saw that in the first session. He then preached to them healed them, came to the disciples on the boat, saved them, then went to Capernaum and preached again the words of life. And yes, it was a hard message to hear. It was a hard message to preach. Bread, flesh, blood. You know, the idea of depending on Jesus the same way we depend on our daily food. He being our spiritual sustenance. It was a hard thing to be heard. But he was preaching genuinely because he wanted them to be saved. He wanted them to believe. And now we get to the end. And from that time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. So what's this whole idea of desertion? Uh, that's actually from the U.S. Army. It's in their military law. It is without authority goes or remains absent from his unit, organisation or place of duty permanently. And the Oxford Dictionary says to abandon a person or a cause or an organisation in a way considered disloyal or treacherous. So the key words are absent, goes away, permanently quits, avoids, shirks, abandons, disloyalty, a cause or a person. And there's been lots of uh, desertions in military history. You may have heard of Arthur Muntz. He was a Confederate soldier. In one of the critical battles of the Civil War, he fired one shot and deserted his position. Did you know what happened to him? He got executed. Thousands of deserters were executed during the Civil War. Most filed face trial and then the firing squad. Henry Stanley, you remember the famous words, Dr. Livingston, I presume? Henry Stanley ended up being a journalist. He was a deserter twice, got done for desertion twice in his early years. When I was in Bougainville, um, the PNGDF soldiers had been out there by themselves for quite some time and they had completely lost faith in the cause. And the, many of them were deserting and going across to the enemy as they were known then. But I reckon there's a lot of individual desertions, micro desertions, things that happen every day. I remember at, at school, I had a really good mate, we were great friends, and you know, we used to pay out on each other a fair bit and that kind of thing. And we went on this camp, and I overheard him talking to one of these other kids, and he was like, it was a whole backstabbing kind of thing. I was like, oh, oh, that really hurt. I feel like deserted. I thought you're my friend, I thought you're on my side, and then I found that he kind of wasn't. And you know, get all those feelings of betrayal and stuff. It can happen relationally when a girl leaves you, you just feel deserted. It can happen politically. I mean, we, it's so interesting to me that we go into a state election and the polls are tipping a swing back to Labor. Now, I don't want to get all political on you, but isn't it interesting how people are just, right, well, I'm not happy with you. We've only given them three years. I'm not happy with you, so I'm going to go over here. It's a, it's a form of desertion. It happens all the time. And so this whole idea of, going back to what lay behind, not walking with him. When we talk about God, when we talk about Jesus, desertion is ratcheted up to a whole new level. It's kind of like the branch deserting the vine or oxygen deserting air. It's, it's, you know, what actually happens with this desertion? I think it's incredibly 
relevant to us. But with all that kind of build up, I just wanted to ask a question. What is the biggest desertion ever? What is the biggest desertion ever? What is the biggest betrayal, abandonment, shirking ever? Was it this stuff that I mentioned in the Civil War? And every war's had deserters, by the way. Australia had them. Um, we had them in Kokoda. We never talk about them, but it did happen. Yeah, maybe. Is that the biggest one, you reckon? It's a good one. Lucifer betraying God. Taking the angels, the desertion. Adam and Eve. Don't get ahead of me. Judas. Is that the biggest one? We're going to build up to that. Just keep that at the back of your mind. Good answers. Peter. Peter, we're going to get back to that. Today's passage actually points to the biggest desertion ever, but it may not be what you think. I was surprised by it. Let's read. So from John 6, 60. On hearing it, okay, so you've got to go back to the sermons we've done previously, to what it is, but it's all the bread and flesh stuff. It's Jesus feeding. It's Jesus saying, I am the bread of life, emphasizing his Godhood. It's all that. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet, there are some of you here who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. Think about that. He went on to say, this is why I told you, no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him, unless the Father has empowered him, unless the Father has compelled him to come. None can come. And very clearly here, none will continue to come. None will continue to follow. Verse 66, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. 67, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Think about that. He says later, the 12 that he chose. Now he's saying, you do not want to leave too, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I love Peter. Sometimes I don't like him. Here I love him. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, though one of the twelve was later to betray him. So what was the biggest desertion ever? Maybe you're already thinking Judas, something to do with the cross, the disciples leaving. I don't want to answer that just yet. We're going to get there at the end. But in the first part, what I want to ask and answer is another question. It's the question Jesus asked. I'm just putting it to you. You do not want to leave too, do you? Now, we're all feeling maybe pretty good here. Maybe the mums aren't feeling so good trying to look after the kids back there. But you know what it's like in our Christianity and our following of Jesus. It ebbs and it flows. How do you know within five years whether you will still be following or whether you have left? What about 10 years? What about 15? What about 20? Particularly for younger people. Younger people tend to, according to the statistics, 70 to 80% of younger people going to evangelical churches like us, the answer to this question will be, yes, I do want to leave and I have left. And what about you? Like, you know, if you're younger, as you get into the older stages of life where more is taken away than given, do you want to leave too? That was the question put to Job, wasn't it, really? Will you continue to serve God when things are taken away? Here it's a little bit different. But pause and think seriously about that. You do not want to leave too, do you? And this is where we get into the passage a bit. Well, what about when you start to hear some hard stuff? And maybe you've already heard hard stuff from Jesus, as it says here, verse 60. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Well, what was hard about it? Well, it was the bread and the blood, the bread is flesh thing. I found it hard, and I'm sorry, because I don't even know if I preached it properly to you last week. I come away just feeling down about it, because I don't know if I got to the point that I was supposed to get to, because I found it a hard teaching. But I do know that Jesus very much is the bread of life, just in the, in the, the very basic essence of the same way we need bread, we need him. But the way he put it was so strong, and we know it caused controversy throughout the church. But is it that kind of teaching that will cause you to go, I don't want to follow you anymore because that's just hard. It's hard to understand. I just asked to give the Son of God 
the benefit of the doubt because sometimes you're going to hear hard stuff. It could also be hard because of the demands, the personal demands that Jesus makes of us. And I think it was John Piper that wrote a book about what Jesus demands of the world and encourage you to read that. It's just so challenging. He said it nearly broke him when he wrote it. What he demands of us, think about it, 100% followership to the point where he says a hard thing, which is unless you hate your family, unless you hate your mother and your father, you cannot be my disciples. What does that mean? Well, we know that our love for God has to be such that it shadows our love for our family in such a way that we're still loving our family, but it's so small compared to our love for God. And you might go, oh, that's unfair, that's hard. Well, God is God. He made your family. He loves them more than you do, for a start. But that's the kind of stuff that makes us turn away. Have you ever thought of this? We say it so glibly. Take up your cross daily, it says in Luke, daily and follow me. Take up your crucifixion device daily and follow me. Have you thought about that? What does that mean? We know that in one strong sense it means every day if you're going to serve me, it's going to hurt. It's going to cost you something. It's never going to be easy to help other people. It's never going to be easy to follow me and serve as I serve the world. It's going to hurt like carrying a cross up a hill to die. It's hard because of those demands, but they're the demands that he puts on us. And it's also hard because it would be easy in our day and age just to look at Jesus as a wise man, as a sage, as another teacher. But when he starts saying things like, I am the bread of life, and in the Greek emphasizing that he is God, well, no wise teacher or sage says that kind of stuff. You should think that Jesus is just crazy if you think he's a wise teacher. It's hard because he says... I give my flesh for the world. I am the bread of life. He is saying that I am God, and this is the core reason why many of these guys turn away. It's what? You're not just a prophet? You're not just this new Messiah? You're God? For a Jew, that was just anathema. God behind the Holy, Holy of Holies, where only the high priest gets to go in there, and you're telling me, you sweaty, maybe even you know, dirty Jesus in the physical sense of dirt, you are God. That's hard. I'm not, I'm not following you anymore. Now you think about that. You think about when you tell the world that you follow and love Jesus. What, who's that guy? He's a swear word, isn't he? Some ba- he's a baby in a manger at Christmas time. It's hard. Will you, will you turn back because of that? Um, I love... I love G.K. Chesterton. Uh, he writes so well. He, he, he was much of the reason um, C.S. Lewis became a Christian, uh, as I understand it. But he says here, you know, sometimes if you were to read the Gospels for the first time, you would find some surprising things about Jesus. Um, he talks about outbreaks of wrath, you know, like when Jesus is having a go at the Pharisees, like storms above our atmosphere. Atmosphere. They do not seem to break out exactly where we would expect them, but follow some higher weather chart of their own. Nor is there anything meek and mild about Jesus the exorcist. It's much more like the tone of a very business-like lion tamer or strong-minded doctor dealing with the homicidal maniac. Indeed, the real Christ of the Gospels is actually more strange and terrible than the Christ of the church. And I want to say to you, for most of us, the Christ of our head is not like the Christ of the Bible. And that's just one reason to be in, your, in, the, in the Bible, just saturating yourself in his word so you know who this strange and terrible Jesus is. Because like, he does say, surprisingly, hard things. And it's like, will you, will you follow him? You do not want to leave too, do you? What about when you hear this scandalous stuff? What, what do I mean by that? Well, verse 61, aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? In the Greek, that's literally um, the word that we get scandal from. A trap or a stumbling block. It causes a stumbling and a, and a falling. In our English, it's defined as uh, causing general public outrage by a perceived offence against morality or the law, you would have felt a little bit of that as we tried to preach on Jesus talking about 
eating bread and eating flesh and that kind of stuff. Um, not him eating it, but you know, him being that. It's, it's, it's a difficult teaching. It's kind of almost scandalous in some ways. And we know that there's that rich symbology there, but nonetheless, it was scandalous. But here's something else that's scandalous. Here's what was scandalous uh, 50 years ago. Affirming or denying, actually, the beauty of marriage as one man and one woman to produce very cool and special things like intimacy, sacred romance, and babies. That was kind of good back then. Now, if you affirm that as being the only type of marriage, you are affirming a new moral value. You are affirming that other types of marriage are not what God intended. That's scandalous because now the new moral order says that that is okay. And I don't want to get into all that kind of browbeating and stuff. I just want to love all types of people genuinely from the heart. But I want what's best for them as well. And I don't know what's best for them, but God does. And I'm just trying to do what God says and what God says about marriage. Another thing that would be scandalous today is to affirm the uniqueness, the specialness of uh, Jesus and to say that he is the only way. That's scandalous now. Another one would be to uh, affirm the sacredness of all people equally as the Margo Day are bearing the image of God, therefore special, including the unborn child in the womb. No, no, no. You can't speak against the moral order that says choice. Well, now it's scandalous, and more and more it's going to be scandalous for you to be a Christian. I don't know if you realise that. It's, how are you going to negotiate those troubled waters where you don't become a big judgmental wally, bashing people, still able to love people, and yet still able to affirm what God has said is right and good and pure for us? And will you leave Jesus when it gets so hard? Many churches are already leaving, following him in affirming marriage. He was the one that said... Let the, the mystery of marriage, a man comes to a woman, let you know, God has brought them together. He's the one that affirms that, not, not me. But if you affirm it now in, in a public kind of way, you're just scandalous. And will you have to leave when the pressure comes? That's what happens here. You do not want to leave too, do you? Well, what about when you discover the cost is high, very high? I already kind of alluded to it there, where you might lose some friends, lose some... Um, peers lose some respect from people. Verse 62 says here, uh, what if you see the son of a man ascend to where he was before? Now what do I mean by cost there? How is Jesus going to ascend back into that unique kind of trans-dimensional super being oneness with God? It's going to be by this incredibly offensive thing called the cross. That's how he's going to ascend. He's going to go via the cross. He's going to be lifted up via the cross. The Jews hated the idea of that. It was terrible to die on a cross. It was offensive. And here's the thing. You will never go beyond your leader. If you're following someone, think about this, just physically. Say you're following one of the guys or one of the ladies. You're just following. You say, I'm just going to follow you. You'll never go beyond where they are. Never. That's why it's so important not to look at us leaders, but to look at Jesus, because otherwise you'll never go beyond me with my own dodgy faults, or Andrew or Rick, and I know they wouldn't mind me saying that. We all have faults. You'll never go beyond us. Please, follow Jesus. You'll never go beyond where he has gone, but do you realise that to follow him is to be prepared to lay down your life? Now, he may never call you physically like he did with the early church and martyrs all around the world now, but he definitely calls you to lay down your money, lay down your livelihood. And I can say that because I don't draw a wage and I never will draw a wage from this church. But I know that unless you're willing to give those things up and count the cost, you can't be a follower of Jesus. And when you start thinking about that, maybe you're going to go, that's too hard. I need to leave. But I just ask that you wait. Please don't leave. Please don't leave because where else are you going to go? You do not want to leave too, do you? What about when there's just so much pleasure now? There's so much pleasure in, you know, just finding, oh, I don't know, uh, finding riches, finding a, a job that's just giving you sort of like a bit of a power rush, and people are respecting you, or, or finding that girl and you're doing inappropriate things before marriage, or just what's happening on the computer. It's, it's just so pleasurable now, isn't it? 
And those pleasures, like you, you, you go into this cycle where you enjoy that pleasure for a time, it begins to degrade, it needs something new. Why do you think in advertising, these kind of things, MacBooks and other things are always getting upgraded because they know that you will quickly grow bored, you need an upgrade, you need something new and it's the same with every type of pleasure, whether it's buying consumerist pleasure or whether it's sexual pleasure or whether it's um, power pleasure or whatever, you need something new, you need the new job, you need the new upgrade but then even after a while the newness of the new kind of gets old. But there is that pleasure now. And the other thing that happens is it gets in our heart and it starts to choke up our heart and we feel guilty and down and all that kind of stuff because we're in that cycle and God seems distant, God seems far away. He, he promises pleasures as he, at his right hand, but they're off in the future. So will you, will you, will you leave? Because in verse 63, as it says there, the spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. So you know what that means? It doesn't mean that oh, he's asking you to give up all these pleasures and you float around like a mystical, ethereal kind of ghost. It means that whatever pleasures you've enjoyed here on earth, think now, um, think with me, imagine what they'll be like in heaven with your fully redeemed body, where they're within their proper boundaries, within their proper worshipful trajectory, not ending up on themselves. This is, this is what he's talking about here. The spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. But you may want to leave. And I love this um, song. I've just been listening to this album and I really commend it to you by 10th Avenue North. You may remember that song, uh, Lamb of God, that we sung here many times. Hope we can sing that again. That's that same band. This is their new album and they've got this song called Cathedrals and it's built on the metaphor of us as believers in Christ being his dwelling place. We're all cathedrals. I really like that picture. And he says here, far, it's, you listen to the verse, it sounds so much better with me just, than me just saying it, but Father, let your kingdom come. Keep us from our lesser loves. Nothing else can satisfy you. Don't you know that to be true? Like really, like over and over again, you're trying the new things, they wear out, blah, blah, blah. They just don't, you think you wanted it, but then it fades out. That's a lesser love. Nothing else can satisfy. And then he says, our hungry souls reach out Whatever fills us up, but we'll keep on falling down unless we fall in love. Our hungry souls reach out to whatever fills us up, but we keep on falling down until we fall in love, ultimate love, true, beautiful, onenessing love with Jesus. But there's such a temptation to fill up with other stuff that's just going to decay and rot over time. I want to read um, about a desertion that occurred in the New Testament, okay? You go look for it, and don't you don't have to look this up, but it's in Colossians 1.14. I'm going to skim pretty quick. So it's Paul, and he's writing a letter, and he says, Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Okay? That's written before Philemon. In Philemon, Paul writing another letter says this: Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. 2 Timothy, the last letter that we know of what, that he wrote. He's in jail. He's been deserted pretty much by everyone, whether they can't find him or whatever. He's there alone. He knows about desertion. Paul does. And this is what he says to Timothy. Last words, almost right at the end of Timothy. 2 Timothy 4.9. Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved the world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Because he loved the world... He has deserted me. We don't know why he deserted. But the world there, don't get it wrong, it's not talking about the physical world, it's talking about the world and its culture and its accepted behaviours and norms, its accepted aspirations and pleasures and desires. We don't know what it was that he loved about the world. We aren't told. But it could have been money, comfort, sexual pleasure. Maybe it was power. Maybe he was sick of being persecuted. It was terrible for those guys back then. Without the power of God, they were always going to struggle. We don't know. But again, guys, think 5, 10, 15 years in the future. Will you be Demas? Think 5, 10, 15 years in the future in terms of desertion. You know, um, Tim shared so well before about that girl. And I'm sure maybe we've all got people like that that are in lives. We don't even know. If we're deserting, just think, who has the words of life for them? No one. 
It's a terrible thing to desert God because they are then deserted. There is no, at least in that kind of little moment, hope for them. The saddest thing I think I've ever seen is a 94-year-old with skin cancer, barely walking with an oxygen tank, who owns a brand new Audi, has a beautiful woman on his arm. That must be the saddest picture in the whole world. You want to be that guy, be that woman? Because he loved the world, he has deserted me. And I want to note something here about desertion. It hurts. Paul writes from prison, you can see he's feeling deserted. You felt it. But what does it mean then to desert God? From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Verse 66. Now just think again. Jesus just fed them at the start of the chapter. It's still within a few days of that. He preached to them. He healed them. He loved them. And he comes up with this, what was perceived to be a hard teaching in there, like, see ya. Now Jesus, yes, he is God, but over and over again we see God who feels things. He's not just a force, he's a face with feelings. And they are perfectly in balance, as we understand from the Bible. They are perfectly appropriate every time. But he does feel things. How does Jesus feel? Now I think there's something profoundly intense about this verse which is why I put it up as the motif verse 67 you do not want to leave too do you I just it's not stated explicitly but implicitly there's this profound feeling of you're going to leave too now I know God has chosen them and this is the mystery of sovereignty and will and everything else but in that moment Jesus says you're going to leave too are you going to leave Have I not chosen you, the 12? Compare that with verse 70. You're going to leave? You see the yearning there. I I see it. And you might say, I'm not comfortable with that. Well, go to the Old Testament then. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me, to a nation that did not call on my name. I said, here I am, here I am. All day long I've held out my hands to an obstinate people. And you go into Jeremiah, Hosea, amongst judgment on terrible, awful sin, you will see these pleadings of God. And if you're not comfortable with the pleading God, then you don't know the real God. Yes, he's thermonuclear, but he is also pleading and loving and kind. And I've said that many times with the love C.S. Lewis. He's not our grandfather in the sky. He's our father. Full of love and surprising things and power and wrath and judgment. It's all in Jesus. Well, But he yearns for us. And you know, these words of Paul, because he loved the world... He has deserted me because the teaching was hard. He has deserted. Is this going to be you in 5, 10, 15 years? Is it you now? Maybe you're right on the edge. Maybe there's people that you know that have deserted. Will you go to them? Did they desert because the teaching was hard and they just didn't get it? They didn't understand the relational aspects of the Holy Spirit and when he fills us and how he loves us. And well, Maybe it was just scandalizing. It was getting too hard to uphold these values that God has of marriage and sexuality and it's just too hard just give up on it or just maybe end up with a distorted view, too hard deserted because the cost was high because the job was so good, we just got caught up in a busyness, terrible busyness that stops people from hearing the word, stops people from being served while we serve ourselves and I love my job, I love the fact that you've got jobs but please see them as a calling to serve, to love, to see people grow in Jesus. Because he loves stuff, he has deserted me. You can put anything in there. And the question comes again, you don't want to leave too, do you? What will it look like if you do leave? Will it just be the next day, like that guy I talked about last week, just as practices being an atheist for a year and then just decides he likes it? Will it be as obvious as that? No. It'll just be that slow fade. It'll be little decisions over time until eventually 5, 10, 15 years. It's like, yeah, Jesus, I've got this belief like so many people say, but I don't see you with him. Remember, the the definition was to turn back to where you were before, to no longer walk with him. You're not walking with him in your behaviours, in in the spirit that's within you. It's just, you're just flat, you're just dead, you're just... You don't want to leave too, do you? What's going to stop you from doing that, guys? 
I could just moralize now and go, right, I read your Bible, pray, go to church, go to Design God podcast, listen to that. Just do all that stuff. This is the answer to the first question. What's going to stop you from leaving? Verse 65, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. So in the context and the flow of this part of the passage, it's very clear that not only when you come are you coming in God's power, but when you stick at it and you are sustained, even though it's so hard with all the heavy teaching, the hard teaching, the, the denying of those kind of pleasures and just looking to the Lord and enjoying pleasure from him and sweetness from him, that's going to be guiding you. And I just love how Sarah put it before. I just, I, just, I just wish we could be simple with stuff, you know. She just said, oh, what are you going to do, kids, um, when you're having a hard time or something big is happening? You're just going to pray to God for help. You know, if I could sum up this whole sermon about what to do now, it would be, oh, just pray to, just pray to God for help. Because it's only his power in you. And you go, oh, no, that's, no I've got to do something. You're right. All that stuff, stuff may help. It will help. But at the core, it's this very simple faith that says, God, I just need you. And you might think, I don't even have faith, Adrian. I don't want to pray. Okay, pray to God about that. You go, well, that's dumb. I don't care if it's dumb. Just pray to him. He'll sort your faith problem out. Pray to him for faith. Pray to him for understanding. Pray to him for power to, to continue to follow. And not only just survive in your following, but thrive in your following. To have victory in your following. Because that's what God intends. A defeated Christian is just, I don't know, it's, it's, we, we will have defeats, don't get me wrong, but I want to see these victories coming. And I'm just really thankful for how Barb shared this morning. That idea of the boat sailing with just the, the, the sails full. And, and God just... That's where we're at as a church. But it's not just going to be, oh, let's get more people in the pews. And I was so challenged by what Tim said. Are we just inviting people to our programs? Oh, man, oh, that was so profound and so challenging and just so from God. I just, just really think about that, guys. Because even if we are inviting them to our homes and inviting them in, it'll be God within us. You'll be going, I don't want to do that. It's a bit uncomfortable. I'm tired. I'm busy. Pray to God. Just pray to God for help. Just pray to God for help. And I love this next bit. Uh, Simon Peter again. Simon says, verse 68, Well, where are we going to go? You've got the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. If you were to sum up this whole passage, right, just with one word, I'm really interested to know, just remembering the feeding of the 5,000, the trajectory of food and so forth, what would be the one, one word? Don't say Jesus. It's always Jesus. This is the other one word. Faith, yep. What's that? Life. Faith, life, yep, yep, I like that. What else? Persevere, Persevere yep. Sorry, Rick. Believe, yep. Put all them together and then over the top put need. Need. They needed bread in the desert. They needed Jesus to do something to save them. Faith is need. Faith is the recognised absence and my desire all of a sudden not just to follow God, but to hunger for him. I, I, I hunger for him when I'm at that point. I hunger for bread that's not going to go stale and rot. And this is the point that Peter makes is, well, where else are we going to go to get that bread? Where else are we going to go to get the words of eternal life? We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Now, what's, we're back to here and we're finishing because I said I'd finish in 30 minutes and my timer here says 31, so I'm not going too bad. And you, I think Luke's new recording device runs out at 34, doesn't it? Did you do that on purpose? Someone been talking to you? Um, would you just, just um, I don't want to get too heavy on you here, but would you just come on a bit of a journey with me? Okay, so what is the biggest desertion ever? All right. So verse 70 and 71, finishing up John 6, and there's a clear break in the passage, and we'll go on to John 7 um, in a few weeks, but... Verse 70, Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve, yet one of you is a devil? He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. Jesus fed Judas that day. Jesus washed his feet later on. Jesus served Judas. Um, we're told that God loved all people. He loved Judas. Okay, I believe Judas will live eternally with the responsibility of what he did. 
But Judas wasn't the biggest desertion ever or biggest betrayal ever. Come, come with me to the garden, okay? Go to the garden now. Jesus is praying. His disciples fall asleep. This is the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus knows he's going to the cross. He's sweating blood. He's, he's, he's in great anguish. His three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, fall asleep. And he says, couldn't you even just pray for one hour? Is that the biggest desertion? No. The guards and the soldiers come. Judas comes and kisses him. The guards sweep him away. His disciples scatter into the night. Peter and John follow at a distance. Is that the biggest desertion, that the disciples who scattered? No. He's on trial. Peter curses, swears, denies that he knows Jesus and disappears into the night. Is that the biggest desertion? And think, guys, because each one of you could be Peter. Each one of you could be... You're at least the disciples. Do not tell me that you would have stayed with Jesus in the garden. Do not tell me that. And yet he was God and he was deserted in that moment. The people scream, give us Barabbas, the murderer, the thief. Is that the biggest desertion? Pilate washes his hands. Is that the biggest desertion? Herod laughs. The soldiers mock. Is that the biggest desertion? Of their own creator. They mock their own creator. Are you ready for it? The biggest desertion was when God, the Father, looked at his son and saw your sin and turned his face. That was the biggest desertion. And you know why? For you. And there's only one person, and, and I thank, I can't remember the theologian who gave me this insight, but I thank him for it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is only one person in all of history who can genuinely ask that question with any sense of ethics and justice, and that is Jesus, because he had no reason to be forsaken. We do. The pure and holy God should have wiped us out the first moment. We sinned and said he loved us, he tarried, and he sent his son. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, oh man, in John 6, he's got people going away and he says, are you going to leave too? The Father left him here. And nothing of his own kind of sin or anything. And Jesus went there willingly. He willingly laid down his life. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was the biggest desertion. And that is why we're here now. That is why... We love him. That is why we want to sing about him. That is why now we want to go into communion and remember him. And I'm just wondering whether um, Tim might be able to come up and just play the words to that Be Thou My Vision again um, as we come to a time of communion to remember him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? No other no other God like that. I'm just going to pray. Just prepare yourselves for communion. You might think that you're unworthy. You are. That's why you need to pray. Just ask God for help. Just ask God to cover you. That's why we come and remember him now. Let's, um, let's pray. Father, what a magnificent God you are. We'll never truly understand what happened on Golgotha on the hill of the skull in the eternal places where angels wept no doubt they bridled with anger at what was happening to their God and yet you stilled their hand Lord you truly are magnificent truly Lord you are wonderful and beautiful Just take a couple of moments to pray quietly.